tonight's Torah portion, Pinchas, Pinias. I want to say that I went to the beach this last week. You may not know that, but I did. And the beach is normally a place where we relax and take it easy and sort of just, you know, let your feet soak in the salt water, which I, I did some of that, but it was a, it was a productive week. You know, it's, it's sort, sort of a strange way almost. It was a productive week for us, and uh, so praise God, I'm back. I had a chance to minister to some people, um, older believers, and uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were from a Baptist church up in Leesburg, and it was good. It was good, and uh, so praise God. Maybe I'll share about that another time. Um, what, what, what we talked about was really confirming concerning what I've been saying for a long time about the rapture and 1988, 80, 88 reasons why Jesus would come, and how much of a disappointment, how much, was a, how much of a distraction that actually was. So I'll share on that perhaps another time. So it's a nice story portion, Numbers chapter 25, 10 to 31. The story of Pinchas, Pinchas is the, the, main, the main focus here, but I do have three points of interest that we're going to take a look at. So a Hebrew word that I want to introduce right now is uh, kina. Kina, and the word kina is the word that we have in tonight's Torah portion for jealous, zealous, or jealous. It's more so kina, is more so jealousy. The word jealousy in Hebrew, kina. Now, it's used tonight several times in the portion, three or four times in tonight's Torah portion. And we'll talk about perhaps why, why is the word jealous, kina used uh, in regards to God's feelings about Israel. We'll talk about that in a few moments. All right, so the three points of interest has to do with Phineas or Pincus, uh, zealous jealousy, because Phineas or Pincus was jealous and zealous. We'll look at that in a moment. Second point of interest has to do with God's rewards for Phineas as a result of his actions. The third point of interest will have to do with God's Appointed times revisited. God will reintroduce or revisit his appointed times before the people of Israel. This is Israel preparing to enter into the land. Remember that at Mount Sinai in Leviticus chapter 26, God gave his appointed, no, 23, excuse me. God gave his appointed times, and here he is again. He's reminding them or revisiting his appointed times to the people of Israel. So three points of interest. Let's begin to look at Phineas or Pincus. His zealous jealousy. Well, last week we talked about what Finkus did. We'll, we'll revisit that again. What did he do? He acted out in righteousness, right? One act of righteousness brought salvation to many in Israel. I think I mentioned that last week. I'm not sure if I did, but that's what happened. Finkus acted out in righteousness. Remember what the New Testament gives us concerning righteousness. How is righteousness attained? By faith. By faith we attain to righteousness. It is the only way we can attain to the righteousness that is of God. There is a righteousness that's not of God. But the righteousness of God can only be attained by faith. Finkus acts out in righteousness. So clearly faith was a factor. And I think we talked about that last week. So one act of righteousness based on faith brought salvation to many. Does that sound familiar? Does it? Uh, who, who are you thinking of? One act of righteousness brings salvation, which comes by faith, brings salvation to many. So is it possible that Phineas, Phineas, in acting out in his righteous zeal and his jealousy, for God's jealousy, was a type of Messiah Jesus? What do you think? Is, is that even possible? What, why, would that, why would that be? We'll come back to that. Now let's read. Let's read about what Finkus did. We read this last week. Let's read it again. In Numbers chapter 25, we're going to read 6 to 9. Here is what Finkus did. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought his relatives, a Midian woman, in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the, door, at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When Phineas, or Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, 
The priest saw it. He arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced, pierced both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague was, were, were 24,000. So Finkus's faith action, his righteousness, stopped the plague. Perhaps many more, we don't know exactly how many, but perhaps many, many more of the sons of Israel would have perished. Finkus acted out in the love of God, in the zeal of God, in righteousness, and the plague was stopped. Finkus hated evil, recognized it, and intervened. And again, his one act of faith, righteousness, saved many. Sounds a lot like Messiah Jesus, right? So it is, in fact, true. Finkus here is a type of Messiah Jesus. And that's why he becomes the high priest. Because who is, in fact, the high priest? Yeshua Jesus. So Finkus becomes the progenitor of a type of priesthood that points to the Melchizedek priesthood, that points to the royal priesthood that we're a part of. But it's a priesthood of action. It's one that involves aggression. And we see this in Phineas, don't we? We see it in Phineas quite clearly. So Jesus, like Phineas, hated sin and acted out in righteousness on behalf of sin, didn't he? Finkus required faith and boldness and aggression to do what he did. It was that way with Jesus as well. From Mount Hermon all the way to Galgata, faith was required. Aggression in the spirit realm was required. His hatred for sin was the cornerstone of his movement to Galgata. was the basis of his movement to Galgata. So you see, yes. Even Finkus pointed to the reality of what Jesus himself would do, what, what, who Jesus actually is, what he represents, the great high priest who took action. Hated sin. Did Jesus hate sin? Does he hate sin? Absolutely, he hates sin. And his one act of righteousness provided that we would be saved from sin, from the curse of our sin. Wonderful little picture there of Finkus. So Finkus did, did this incredible thing, and it's a, it's a wonder. It's a wonder that, that God rewards him mightily for this. We'll see this in a few moments. But before we look at that, we want to touch on the reality of this particular rebellion. And what rebellion is it? We're talking about the sons of Israel at Baal, Baal Peor. We talked about this last week, right? Uh, Balaam, Balaam wanted to curse Israel for the sake of a little lucre, and he failed. He failed. Finally, we're going to see next week, finally, Balaam had a wonderful idea, and it was to get the children of Israel to transgress themselves, thus bringing a curse upon themselves, and he succeeded. That's the matter of Baal Peor. Now, Baal Peor is the final rebellion before Israel enters into the land. How many cases of rebellion do we have to this point? 14. This is number 14. It's interesting in tonight's Torah portion that Israel, before they entered into the land, had to offer up 14 whole burnt offerings before they entered in. I thought that's I thought that's very interesting. And is it, is it associated with the 14 occasions of rebellion? Uh, perhaps. But it's very clear in tonight's Torah portion. So, Israel rebels against God 14 times. We'll talk about rebellion, witchcraft, and righteousness. How they associate, and they do. Because Phineas, Pincus, acted out in righteousness, and he stopped the rebellion. He put a stop to it with one act of righteousness again. What did Samuel tell us about witchcraft and rebellion? That they are associated. 
that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We need to spend a little time on this. Try to discover what Samuel was talking about. Now, I did see when we began to look in the book of Numbers and we began to observe and see all of the different rebellions, I did see that at some point I'm going to address the issue of rebellion and how it associates with witchcraft. Now, I've heard many teachings on this and many good teachings on it. I've heard some teachings on it that's a little questionable. Uh, I've never done anything really excellent in regards to teaching on this. But I want to offer a certain possibility here tonight. You know, I love possibilities because I don't have all the answers. Any preacher that gets up and preaches dogmatically, definitely, as if he has all the answers, he's not dealing with a full deck of reality. His cards are not full. So I love possibilities because we don't have the answers, right? So I throw out possibilities. So we're going to talk about the possibility concerning what rebellion, witchcraft has in common and how they associate. I want to say to you that witchcraft is a spiritual contaminant. That's obvious, right? It is a spiritual contaminant. It contaminates, and so does rebellion. Rebellion, when, when, when embraced, internalized, functions just like witchcraft. It has the same contaminating effect. And when I say contaminating, I'm also pointing to it being contagious. Contamination, contagiousness, same thing. So rebellion is contagious. If you have 10 souls in a room, let, let's, let's bring it down to, to, or take it to a place where most of us can relate. Let's talk about the boardroom. You know what the boardroom is? How many of us have been to a boardroom? Corporate, corporate setting, you're in the boardroom, and there's a power meeting ensued, and you've got 10 people sitting at this board table, and powerful things are happening. Some people are disgruntled. Some people are uh, uh, defensive. Some people are uh, unhappy. Some people are very happy being paid a lot of money. So this is happening. Now, the people that are disgruntled are at this board meeting. And the meeting ensues. One person is conducting the meeting. Typically, that's the case. He's doing the action register. Who knows what an action register is? He's doing the action register, the, uh, the action items and everything, and he's conducting the meeting. So there are four people that are disgruntled. Suddenly, one of them expresses his or hers disgruntledness. He or she is bold enough to do it and expresses their, their disgruntledness. What happens to the four? Suddenly, the other three are going to rise up because the disgruntledness has been expressed. It has been exposed. So, so all of a sudden, you have almost half of the people in the meeting in rebellion, expressing their disgruntledness towards the company, for instance. Now, if that isn't brought to check, what happens? You might find that the people that are on the line sort of not so sure, will be drawn into it. And before long, you have a meeting where seven people are coalescing together in what we call rebellion. That is the effect of rebellion that's similar to that of witchcraft. Witchcraft does the same thing. Witchcraft is a contaminant. And if you accept it, if you allow it, it permeates. And this is what's happening in the camp of Israel. It's permeating throughout the, throughout the camp of Israel. It began with the leadership. And God knew that he had to do something about the leadership. But Finkus, one action, one act of righteousness, put an end to the rebellion and stamped it out completely. Now, back to the boardroom. Those four people that initiated the mutiny in that boardroom, the thing that they rebelled about, the thing that they were disgruntled about, was totally unjust. But you know what happened? As they became stronger and they, draw, they drew the other people into it, it seemed as if the thing that they were rebelling about was absolutely just. Why? 
because there was an impetus, a building impetus, a movement within that boardroom where the thing that was wrong and unjust became just. That's how rebellion can be as witchcraft. And what does the Bible tell us about witchcraft? To avoid it. It's a little more heavy than that. The Bible says, do not allow the witch to live, to exist in the camp of Israel. Where does that put us with rebellion? If witchcraft is as rebellion, where does that put us with rebellion? It cannot exist. That's why God was so adamant when he spoke through Samuel to Saul concerning his sin. His transgression was great because he rebelled against God. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we saw that even Moses rebelled against God. Yes. So, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, is there anyone in this room tonight that's incapable of rebellion? Uh, is there anyone in this room that's incapable of rebellion? No. We are all of us, each of us, subject to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the pressure, to the attraction in the natural man towards rebellion. Because rebellion loves company. You, you, you thought I was going to say misery, right? <laughs> rebellion loves company. That's the contaminating aspect of rebellion that, that, that looks and functions like witchcraft. I've been around witchcraft. I worked with a woman for 20-something years who was a practicing witch. I exposed her, by the way. I exposed her to be a witch. I know how witchcraft works. I've been around it. It's a, it's a horrifying thing, folks. It's a contaminant. It can get into your soul. You have to be very careful with it. You also have to be very careful with rebellion. And in terms of the congregation, Israel in this case, there is no place for it. God wrote off his king, so he appointed Saul, he anointed Saul, and wrote him off completely. Replaced him because of that rebellion. All right, so Vincus, the main point I want to bring to light here again before I move on is that one act of righteousness, one act of faith leading to righteousness put an end to all of the rebellion. The witchcraft, the, the rebellion was put aside by the righteousness of Vincus. One act. And again, there's a picture there of Messiah Jesus. Now, let's talk about God's determination to reward Phineas or Vincus. What did God say to Phineas, Vincus, as a result of his action? He was going to give him an eternal, a perpetual priesthood. But wait a minute. God promised that to Moses, Aaron. So, so here in the, midst of, in the midst of the priesthood, God is assigning, he's, he's recognizing, appointing, anointing another, another person for the eternal priesthood. And this other person, of course, is a son of Aaron. What about the other sons of Aaron? If, if Phineas is being selected by God because of his righteousness to carry the priesthood forward, what about the other sons? They were excluded. Yes, they were. The priesthood is perpetuated through Phineas because of his righteousness. I want you to absorb just how profound that one action was. That God determined that the eternal priesthood will function through Phineas, will come through Phineas, and it did. So let's read. Chapter 25, now I'm going to read 10 to 13 as it relates to how God responded to Phineas. 10 to 13, chapter, five, chapter 25. Let's see. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel in that he was jealous. There's that word now, kinah, that he was jealous 
with my jealousy among them so that he did not so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy so God was jealous and Phineas took on the jealousy of God there's so much there that we can look at the word kina which is the word for jealousy it, it does mean jealousy sometimes we say well it means zealous but that's not the case <laughs> 38 times the word kina is used for jealousy once for zealous and in every case in numbers where the word jealousy kina is used it's referring to jealousy so God is jealous how does that resonate in us that the God who created everything brought everything into existence is a jealous God kina how do we feel about that why would God need to be jealous we, we see jealousy as sort of a weakness right don't we we see jealousy as, as, as a weakness if you're jealous you've got a problem <laughs> how many of us have experienced jealousy all right now I'm not only talking about jealousy as it relates to husband and wife I'm talking about jealousy in in general Jealousy is, is, is sort of a, a human reaction to disappointment. God is disappointed with Israel, and he becomes jealous. I, I wish the word kina meant zealous, but it really does not. It means jealous. So what is that about? The children of Israel were committing fornication, basically adultery, with Belpior, with this, the daughters of Midia and the daughters of, of Moab. They were committing adultery. Who is the children of Israel? The children of Israel, Israel, who does Israel belong to? God. God has determined that Israel would be his wife. Did he? Did he not make that determination? Is it not portrayed throughout the word of God, even in the prophets, Isaiah, uh, many places, that Israel is slated, destined to be the bride of God himself. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. I will make a new covenant with them. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers at Mount Sinai. When I brought them out of Egypt, my, that covenant which they broke, even though I was a husband to them, God said. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. So God sees Israel as his wife. He is jealous for his wife. His wife is at Baal Peor, this high place on the east side of the Jordan, committing adultery. He's jealous. So jealousy, even though it comes from a place of the fallen nature, is natural in the fallen nature. Right? The fallen nature is not natural. But in that place of the fallen nature, jealousy becomes an emotion that even God himself experienced. And Phineas, Phincus, took on God's pain. You follow what I'm saying? He took the pain of God. Who else did this? Jesus. Messiah Jesus. He took on the hurt of God and went to the cross on behalf of God's pain and provided justification to life. Because he was jealous with God's jealousy. I want to echo what I said earlier. Phincus is a picture of Messiah. In that he was jealous for God's jealousy. He, he pained God's pain. He had that passion. And in doing so, he provided justification. Phincus provided justification, folks. Life. People's lives were saved because of his faith and righteousness. You see that picture. I don't need to belabor it anymore. Phincus becomes the high priest, not just the high priest, but the progenitor of the high priest to come. Let's read on. Therefore, verse 12, chapter 25, Therefore say, Behold, I give him a covenant of peace. 
And it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. By now, you see very clearly the typology between Phincus and Jesus. By now, you're seeing it. He is a high priest. By his act of faith, his jealousy for God, his passion for what God was feeling, for God's pain, he provided atonement. So, I think we can say here that when Phincus acted out the way he did, God recognized his son in Phincus. Remember a few weeks ago I said to you that it is my contention that there are times when God would even present, prevent himself from seeing our choices. I believe it to be absolutely true. It, it has to do with the reality of free will. God gives us free will to choose. And he wants us, like I've said before, he wants us to surprise him with right actions, with right choices. The only way that can happen is if he looks away from our choice. So, there's a possibility that God said, look at what has happened to my bride-to-be. Who's going to stand up and act out in righteousness? God could have said, I know exactly who's going to do it. He could have looked into the future. He knows the end from the, be he knows the, end from the beginning. But perhaps he chose not to. Just to see if someone, anyone, would take a stand for righteousness and act out on my behalf. And when Phincus did it, God was pleasantly surprised. It seems to read that way, doesn't it? And, it, and perhaps God saw his action and said, oh, he is carrying out righteousness and faith and he is making atonement. That's a picture of my son. And I'm going to give him an everlasting name Perpetual priesthood. I'm just about convinced of it. Now, Phineas had a son. Later on. One of the descendants of Phineas. Now, remember that God said to your descendants, right? I will give you an everlasting name. A, a perpetual priesthood. One of the sons of Phineas. A very important character in the Bible. His name was Zadok. We're talking about Zadok. Zadok. He became the progenitor of what's called the Zadokite priesthood. The Zadokim priesthood. You've heard about the Zadokite priesthood, right? The sons of Zadok. Well, who was this Zadok? Zadok was the high priest during the time of King David. And Zadok, Zadok, like his father Phineas, was a priest of action. David appointed Zadok as the high priest. Because Zadok, Zadok, was filled with the zeal of God. And he himself was jealous for the things that God was jealous about. And we're going to see that here in a few moments. God recognized in the son of Phineas, Zadok, the same attributes of Zadok. And promised Zadok a perpetual priesthood as well. And that Zadok will be that righteous priest. So let's read in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2, I'm going to read 33 to 34. Uh, they're all relevant, so let's just read. 33 to 34, actually at 36. Uh, 2 Samuel ch chapter 2. Yet I will cut off. No, he's speaking here to Eli and his two sons, right? What was his two sons' name? Phineas and Hophni. Hophni. Yet I will... I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar so that my eyes will not fall, fail from weeping and your soul grieve. And all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. He's speaking to Eli. So remember, Eli here was a son of Phincus. That's why he named his son Phincus. He was a son of Phincus. But Eli failed. I, I want you to see this. Eli failed, and God determined that he will raise up another priest, a priest that will be righteous. Who was the next high priest after Eli? 
Zadok. Zadok was the next high priest. Samuel was a son of, of, of Phinehas, yes. But he wasn't the high priest. The next high priest to follow after Eli was Zadok. Let's read about this. This will, be this, this will be the sign to you which will come concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. On the same day, both of them will die. Not something you want to hear. But I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and in my soul. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like Phineas. Phineas was that priest who did what was in God's heart, what was in God's soul. And he was jealous for the things that God was jealous for. God is saying now to, to Eli before he dies that I am going to raise up a priest like your father, Phineas. That's in effect what he's saying. In my heart and my soul, and I will build him an enduring house, and he will walk before my anointing, before my anointed always. So God's going to build this priest uh, an enduring house. There is that word enduring that relates to an everlasting house. Same promise that he gave to Phinehas, and he will walk before my anointed always. That's important. Everyone who is left in, the, in, in, in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and say, Please, assign me one of the priest's office so that I may eat, and I may eat a piece of bread. So, what is God saying? Now, this is, this is a prophet that appeared to Eli. What is God saying to Eli concerning this priest that he will raise up? That you will bow down to him. He will take over the priesthood. In other words, all of the priests that will follow will come from him. By the time the second temple is built, all of the priests were sons of Zadok. They were all related to Zadok. You go study in, in Zechariah, for instance, you see it. When you read the chronology associated with Jesus, you see that, yes, Zadok was that progenitor. Now, let's go to Ezekiel now, concerning the sons of Zadok, chapter 44. What we see here in Ezekiel now, as it relates to the third temple, the temple that's yet to be built, that the Zedokite priesthood is associated with that third temple, the sons of Zadok. But wait a minute. That's the temple that Jesus would arrive and sit in. The third temple. Right? Do we believe that or do we believe it's going to be the Antichrist? What do we think? The Bible doesn't say it's the Antichrist's temple. The Bible says it's the temple of God. Right? Do we believe the Bible? So the third temple will be God's temple. In that temple, the sons of Zadok will minister as priests. That's what Ezekiel saw from Ezekiel chapter 40 all the way to 48. Over and over, we have several references in 40 to 48 where it is mentioned the sons of Zadok will be the priests that will minister in that temple. So there's something there for us, isn't there? Let's read in chapter 44 now, 15 and 16. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, so you see, from God's perspective, the priesthood is the sons of Zadok. All right? But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept my charge, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the sons of Israel went astray from me. So what is he referring to? He's referring to the times of King David. When Israel went astray during that period and following King David. But the sons of Zadok, Zadok the high priest, and the sons of Zadok kept his charge shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat of the blood, the fat and the blood, declares the Lord. They shall enter my sanctuary, they shall come near to my table to minister to me and keep my charge. These sons of Zadok, Zadok the high priest, this, this, these sons of Zadok are the ones who will minister in this third temple. They will handle the offerings. 
the korbanot. They will come near to God. So hold on a minute here. Who was Zadok? He was the high priest of King David. He was a royal priest. Think about it. Zadok was the high priest during the time of King David, the first real legitimate king of Israel. So Zadok was a royal priest. What did Peter say about our priesthood? It is a royal priesthood. Why is Peter referring to our priesthood as a royal priesthood? Because we are in the order of the Melchizedek priesthood. What does the word Melchizedek mean? Righteous king. Righteous king. There's a priesthood that involves righteousness. And you already know that I'm pointing back to Fincus, don't you? Because you're following what I'm saying. There is a righteous priesthood that's based on action. A warring priesthood, as, as I've referred to it before. But it's a royal priesthood because it's centered around a king. So you have a righteous priesthood that centers around action that involves a great king. We're talking about the Melchizedek priesthood. How many of you were here last Sunday, or was it last Sunday? Last Shabbat. <laughs> when I read Psalm 110, remember, remember Psalm 110? The Lord says to my Lord, sit up. I call it the war psalm. Why do I call it the war psalm? Because Melchizedek, the high priest, is a warrior, a warring priest. The whole psalm is about that, isn't it? This is Phineas, a righteous priest. And a, and a king, serving the king. Now, Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 6, talked about the office of the priest and the office of the king as being one. Remember, we, how many of us recall what I'm referring to? Let's go to Zechariah. It's worth the while. Let's just hop on over to Zechariah chapter 6. Not Zephaniah, Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 6 now. You see, all of these wonderful pictures are tied together nicely for us to see. First of all, Zechariah was a Zedokite priest. But beyond Zechariah being a Zedokite priest, there was a priest at this time, and his name was... Come on. There was a priest, a high priest, at this time, and his name was... Yeshua. His name was Yeshua. Joshua. And it states very clearly in the passage that he was a Zedokite priest. Let's read. 11. We'll read 11 to, uh, to 12. Now, why are we reading these verses? Because I want to tie together, tie together for us tightly the reality that Phincus was a righteous priest, a warrior, a, warrior, a warrior priest, he was righteous, and he was the high priest. And so was Zadok. And God promised him an eternal priesthood. But all of that was pointing or analogous to Yeshua, the high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the royal priesthood, which Peter said, you are being built into. Did Peter not say that? that you are being built into a royal priesthood. Take silver and gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Yeshua, the son of Yehozadak. Yehozadak means the God of Zadok, the high priest. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Zemach, branch, for he will, Zemach, branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Who's going to build the temple? The Zemach. He will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. So on his throne, we know he's a king. He's a king. And he's going to build the temple. 
Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. This is Jesus. This is Yeshua. The high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, the ultimate Zedokite. The ultimate son of Phincus is Yeshua. When God was impressed with the actions of Phincus, he said, wow, look at what this son of Aaron did. He just painted a picture of my son, and I'm going to reward him for it. I'm going to give him an eternal priesthood. Folks, you are sons of Zadok. You are a part of that priesthood. I know this is not Sunday morning Christianity here. I understand that. Sunday morning Christianity does not fit into what I'm talking about. How many pulpits come Sunday morning are going to be referring to the Zedokite priesthood? How many pulpits are going to echo that we are sons of Phincus? Because of the righteousness that he exhibited and painted that picture of Yeshua, how many, how many preachers will get up and declare that we ought to be like Phincus and act righteously with God's jealousy? How many of us are jealous for God's jealousy, folks? How many of us will hate sin and rebellion and witchcraft to the extent that we will stomp it out? And stomp it out, we will. There's no place in God's house for it. It's a contaminant. So, let's get back to the positive message. You are sons of Zadok. You are honored, chosen by God, appointed. Appointed beyond many, folks. Many are called. Few are chosen. You're appointed to be part of something that's eternally glorious. Eternally glorious. And you're not special. Neither am I. But yet you're called and appointed. Anointed. Oh, what's going on? How can that be that I am not special? But yet I am called to something that's eternally glorious. Because God wants to glorify, glorify himself in broken me. That's why. Broken me, broken you. God wants to glorify himself in the broken vessels that we are. It gives him glory, it brings glory to him. He is exalted and glorified when it happens. And he wants it. And he is jealous for it. He is. He is jealous for the bride of his son. He was jealous for his bride. He is jealous for the bride of his son. His son will not tolerate any bel peors in his house. Only righteousness and zeal and jealousy. That's all, that's all. That's all we're going to have here. Righteousness, jealousy. And zeal. So the allegorical pictures here are really <laughs> powerful. Powerful. How do you feel about being, being a part of an eternal priesthood? How, how do you feel about being, being sons of Phincus? How does that grab you that you are sons of Zedok? And that you will function in that third temple, the temple of God. How does that make you feel? How does the things that you struggle with now stack up against that? Am I struggling with something? Yeah. Every day. Every day I am struggling with something. I took my wife to the beach. You say, oh, you had a vacation. I had a what? A what? 
No, I was the, I was the cook, the chief bottle washer, the chauffeur, the bag carrier. I was the guy that, that brought water from the beach to wash off her feet so she can go upstairs. I was a servant this week. And in the midst of that, I'm dealing with drama. Drama. I know difficulty. And we all do. Is there anything that I will not suffer for the sake of this eternal priesthood? Should I say, well, I'm under pressure here and I'm just going to sit back and whine about this until things get better? What do you think? Sometimes I feel like that. I do. Sometimes I feel that way. I, once or twice for about a nanosecond, I you know what? I deserve to be treated better. Just for a nanosecond. I deserve more than this. I give myself. I'm committed to this whole cause. I pour myself out for everyone. I deserve better treatment as I bite into my taco sore strips and everything else. Saturday. <laughs> I can't even get done eating my tacos without feeling sorry for myself. But folks, nothing, no amount of pain, adversity, and difficulties can compare to the glory that's, that's set apart for each of us. In this eternal, in this eternal priesthood, folks, a priesthood, who are we going to be serving? Isaiah chapter 56. We're going to serve the sons of Israel in the temple. We're going to be saris, court officials, folks. We got to get rid of this Sunday morning Christianity attitude. We got to get rid of it. Because that attitude would hold us back, folks. No more pretense. No more using spiritual terms to prove that we're spiritual. If we're hurting, say you're hurting. If you're stumbling, if you're, if you're, if you're bleeding, say I'm bleeding, say I'm stumbling. If you pretend, you'll never be healed. You will never recover. You guys didn't know I could be this tough, right? I can be much more tough. This is far too serious a calling that God has placed upon us to get caught up in flivorous things. Far too serious. The anointing is way too powerful to play with it. Serious. This is, this is, this is, this is it, folks. The rubber hits the road. Can't you smell it? The rubber hits the road, folks. Serious times, but they're good times. All right, let's move on. The third point of interest, interest that I wanted to talk about has to do with God's appointed times. And here in chapter 28 of tonight's Torah portion and Numbers, he revisits all of the appointed times from Shabbat all the way to Sukkot. And what, why is he doing this? After 40 years in the wilderness, and by the way, in the wilderness, they did not celebrate the seven festivals, but they did celebrate Shabbat. Right? We know this. But in the wilderness, they didn't keep the seven festivals. But at the end of the process, of the wilderness process, God is once again reminding them concerning his festivals. That's indicative of the fact that he wants them to begin to celebrate the festivals as they enter or prepare to enter into the land. And this is, this, this is exactly what happens. God instructs Israel to observe Pesach right before they entered, as they entered, and they were to continue to celebrate the festivals in the land. The subsequent history is that Israel did not. She failed to celebrate the festivals over the next 1,500 years or so. Uh, they were not consistent in keeping the festivals. And in fact, some would say, some would argue, and I would, that this was a part of the reason why Israel failed and ultimately were driven out into the wilderness. Yes, they did not keep his festivals. They did not honor him. So we know, we know what transgressions Israel engaged in in order to be driven out. Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel will come here and we'll celebrate, or 
We won't celebrate. But we will remember Tisha B'Av. Right? What is Tisha B'Av about? All of the times that God struck Israel because of their sin. Now, the Jewish people would take Tisha B'Av and look at it from the standpoint of adversity and persecutions that they suffered. And not so much look at it as God's chastisement. But that's exactly what it is. God said this very clearly in, in Leviticus chapter 26. Should Israel engage in idolatry and persist in idolatry, here are the five things I'm going to do. And God carried them out. Tisha B'Av is the effect of God's judgment upon Israel. So we live in a time when God is no longer striking Israel. He's no longer bringing judgment upon Israel. We live in a time, post-judgment period for Israel, when God is now restoring Israel to the land, just as he said in Leviticus chapter 26. The time of restoration is where we are. So uh, for that reason, I don't see any need to celebrate Tisha B'Av. But Israel struggled greatly because of their transgression, idolatry, violating the Shabbat, not keeping his festivals, defiling the land. That's what they did. God, God wanted his festivals kept, honored, and celebrated. And I am convinced that if Israel had kept his festivals, they would have been perpetually, year in, year out, reminded of God's goodness and his intent towards them. But they did not. So I guess what I'm saying is, Yes, Israel transgressed against God. They engaged in idolatry. Uh, the worst type of idolatry. But perhaps, had Israel commit themselves to the celebration, the recognition of his festivals, it would have been a compass for them. What do you think? You think that's a, a fair assessment? I am convinced of it. Just the reality of honoring his festivals, his Shabbat, would have been a light to Israel, a guide to them. Because it would have involved obedience and faith. Perhaps the story of the Bible would have been different had Israel embraced God's instructions concerning his festivals. God's festivals are important. And as a congregation, for many years, we have celebrated his festivals. And we have come to know the very thing that I said just now, that his festivals are a light to us. They are a guide to us. They keep, they keep us focused from year, from year to year. They do. And Israel failed to keep his festivals and transgressed before him horribly. Now, we know that in Christianity in general, his festivals are effectively unheard of. Even the Shabbat isn't celebrated in Christianity. You say, wait a minute, you've gone too far. What about Sunday? We celebrate the Shabbat. It's only on Sunday. Well, you keep Sunday. You don't keep the Shabbat. <laughs> you, you, keep, you keep Sunday. You know, like I said before, there is no way I can get... Uh, 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 a good chicken, uh, chicken biscuit from Chick-fil-A on a Sunday morning. There's no way. I look for it. They're closed. Why? Because it's the Christian Shabbat. Christians are celebrating Shabbat on Sunday. It's not Shabbat. <laughs> Shabbat is Saturday. So Christianity today, and you know I have to take a shot at Christianity, right? They so richly deserve it. Christianity today not only are they not celebrating his seven festivals that are very important and relevant to the fulfillment of God's will and purpose and prophetic in nature, they're not even celebrating the Shabbat. What did God do in regards to chastisement for his people Israel for not keeping the Shabbat, for not keeping his festivals, for engaging in idolatry? What did God do with his people? What did Paul say in Romans chapter 11 about Israel? Effectively, if he was hard on them, he will also be hard on you. So, before, before I end, I think I must 
present the reality that I am a Christian. And my love for Christianity, my jealousness for Christianity, brings me to a point of zeal. Like Fincas, I will speak out against the obvious evil that exists in the Christian landscape. Because I'm jealous for the bride of Messiah. I'm jealous with his jealousy. Ephesians chapter 5, folks. Paul says that Messiah Jesus is jealous for his bride. He's coming for a bride that's been washed clean, pure. He's jealous for his bride. If he's jealous, what about you? Are you complacent about the condition of his bride? Or are you jealous with his jealousy? You should be. You should be. Your sons are Fincas. Your daughters are Fincas. You're a part of the Zedokite priesthood. A royal priesthood. In the age to come, you will be that priesthood that will reign with the great high priests. According to Melchizedek, you will. Give up everything for the sake of it, folks. Lay down everything. Put everything to the cross. Nail the stuff to the cross. I keep returning to the message of the cross, the true message of the cross, where we crucify our flesh. That's the true message of the cross, folks. Atonement, the blood of the Lamb, provided so that I can nail my junk to the cross and live in victory, overcoming the natural man that's so prone to witchcraft, rebellion. I nail him to the cross. Every time he starts bouncing around, feeling sorry for himself, wanting to rebel, coalesce, I got to nail him to the cross. Because that's where he belongs. That's where he deserves. That's what he deserves. The cross. If I don't do it, there's no room for me in the house of God. None. There's no place here for me if I do not crucify that individual to the cross. None. I can fake it. But not for long. Shabbat Shalom.